here we go, ladies and gentlemen. If you're joining me now, you're joining me live, uh, and I'm really excited uh, to bring to you um, someone who is definitely a leader in the space, and uh, I trust will be hugely informative, and I'm really excited to hear um, from the coalface uh, exactly what are both the macro and perhaps some of the micro features of the economy at the moment. And I know it's almost impossible to predict exactly what's going to happen, but these guys are the ones that uh, certainly are, are best equipped to do so. So um, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Sharon Zolner. Now, Sharon um, started her career at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. She worked there for 10 years, and she's actually been with ANZ now for 10 years. Is that right, Sharon? That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for the last three of those is the chief economist. And, and is that for the entire ANZ group? Just for ANZ in New Zealand. That's enough. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> um, and, and to be fair, I appreciate the speciality because we really want to talk about the New Zealand market. I know that we're part of a global market, um, but most of the audience today, I'm sure, joining us is uh, based in New Zealand. So that's where we really, um, I guess, have the highest value. But um, that's not the only thing. In fact, you're, um, uh, you, you're related to Richie McCaw. I am. I am originally Sharon McCaw. He is oh, my, my goodness. father's cousin's grandson. Very close. I can't even follow that. Hmm. <laughs> <My> children, <laughs> are his 40 second cousins? Something like that. Incredible, but a, a name worth being associated to. And on a more serious note, though, you, uh, I guess, developed um, the trucker meter. Mm, yeah, so that's um, traffic data that the New Zealand Transport Agency, Waka Kotahi, had actually been collecting for a long time, that, um, but no one was even aware of it. So I stumbled across this treasure trove, uh, which uh, was very exciting. So for the New Zealand economy, the truck data is a very good real-time indicator of, of GDP growth, but more unexpectedly, the car traffic uh, generally gives a six month lead on the economy. It doesn't always get it right, it doesn't see things like financial crises coming, for example, but um, as long as the economy is sort of left to do its thing, then it gives you a really good steer on where the momentum is going. Uh, so last year, for example, it, it pointed clearly that the economy was slowing, even though the reasons for that weren't clear at the time, uh, which- we uh, when, when last year? Uh, it started to fall from about the middle of last year. Well, even earlier than that, actually. And so, um, Therefore, we were ahead of the market in picking that the Reserve Bank was going to cut the interest rates last year because we mm -hmm. could see from this traffic data that actually we were losing momentum. The reasons for that still aren't very clear, actually. So um, it's not entirely known why it correlates so strongly. But no, no there's a few it is. Uh, One would be that tradespeople driving around in their vans or not, they're not a big proportion of traffic, but they could be a big proportion of the variation in traffic that they're a lead indicator uh, but there's also a decent correlation really quite a good one with net immigration so population growth more more people more equals more cars and that that takes quite a long time to feed through to into the economy but what's interesting at the moment is that well ever since we got rid of the departure cards the migration data has become very unreliable and prone to oh, wow. huge revisions um and at the so moment hang on a second can i just stop you there so we've got rid of the departure cards gosh it's been a while since i traveled last time i traveled i'm yeah. sure i was filling one of those things out hmm Yes, yeah, so we got rid of those because they were just annoying. But the trouble is they were actually quite useful for estimating our immigration and immigration statistics. So now the basically Stats New Zealand is kind of guessing when you come in how long you're going to stay and therefore whether you're a short term or a long term uh, visitor. And as you stay or don't, you get put into different buckets. And so that can lead to quite large revisions. And so at the moment, the official migration data is saying that net migration soared last year, like just went nuts. Uh, yet the traffic data declined through that period. So, which is highly unusual, right? It's very unusual to see a discrepancy that large. So, our suspicion is that the data will be revised down. But given COVID and everything that's going on with the border and the wacky stuff that's going on with immigration at the moment, um, who knows, really? <laughs> it's a yeah. bit, bit murky, like many things in the economy at the moment. So essentially, we're in very unusual times and it's been done to death, that kind of saying. But weirdly enough, the trucker meter somehow predicted that there would be a turn, a downturn in the economy. And it just so happened that COVID was maybe an additional factor in this. Yeah, yeah, no, it correctly predicted the slowdown in the second half, in the over 2019, which was then confirmed in the business sentiment indicators and that sort of thing. Um, but 
fair to say, but that by about January, it was starting to look like whatever it was that had put us a bit off track was was dissipating and things were starting to look like they were really going to lift. See, this is forward. interesting. I, I, I'm curious happened. to... Yeah, I, I'm, well, I'm curious to pick up a thread because if, um, and I'm going to speak specifically about the Auckland market, just because it's the one that I know best um, most recently. I do work, and, and I know you do, right through the country, but um, at least in the Auckland real estate market, we had actually been, I don't know, it had been a little bit quieter than some of the heated moments right up until that last quarter of last year. And then we were seeing numbers pick up, not necessarily flowing through into the volume of transactions at that point, but definitely in terms of some upward pressure on price and increased number of purchasing intentions, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I say that anecdotally, but I heard it from just about every agent I was talking to. So it was kind of across Auckland that that was spiking or starting to come up. Um, and then so my predictions at that point was, man, we're going to be off to a pretty strong start in 2020. Um, but at the same time, and you might laugh at this, but I um, run boutique accommodation stuff as well. And so we noticed we had like almost our worst ever February, like it was terrible. Um, and January wasn't great, but we weren't sure why that was. But by the time February came around, I think everyone knew exactly why um, we were the sort of canary in the coal mine. But what happens in relation, you know, if we're talking truck meter first, and, and I know COVID's an important topic, and I want to talk a bit more about it. But if we come back and just take COVID out of the equation to get into more simpler times, how does the real estate market work in relation to that truck meter, or is there no correlation? <laughs> yeah, that was quite interesting because you segued effortlessly from the economy into the housing market in fact <laughs> that's my job inflated the two which <laughs> yeah so don't so call me on that i'm not wanting to confuse yeah but that is basically what people do <laughs> and that's why it's so interesting at the moment because the housing market and the economy are going in completely different, different directions supposedly and that is that is really very strange and and very unexpected so um, hang on a second whilst they're not the same thing they are normally correlated Yes, yes, they are. They do tend to move together. We just don't get housing booms and recessions. So, uh, and Although that's, that's what we're seeing now. all got this one wrong. And of course, it matters the most that the Reserve Bank has got it wrong because they're the ones who set the interest rates and the LVR restrictions and all the rest of us, rest of it. But it's yeah. embarrassing for all of us. But <laughs> it is, as you indicated, very unusual times. Um, and But I, I do think, just coming back to your question before we move away yeah, from that, um, I do think that if COVID hadn't, come along, we would be having very similar discussions about how awkward it is that how the housing market is going so strongly because those interest rate cuts we had last year were starting to feed through into higher housing demand. Yeah. And so some of these these awkward, these awkward discussions about housing affordability and so on, I, I think they would have happened without COVID. But the fact that we've, we're, we are forecasting that we're going into recession and that there will be job losses and stuff certainly makes that a more pointed discussion at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just going to rewind to when this thing was really coming into effect and talking with, you know, people that I really um, respect who think about this kind of thing, saying, hey, you know, this is going to be huge and you cannot underestimate the uncertainty that job losses are going to bring to the general population. Um, at the same token, either we haven't seen that yet or people have got so caught up in the fact that by having interest rates at half of what they were prior, um, they're now able to spend the same amount of money or a little bit more and it actually works out to be cheaper i, I i'm going to talk about it just as a lay person because i and i and i'd love you to pardon me i think it's both those things basically yeah. the housing market all the positives for the housing market have been instant the rate cuts from last year and now the further rate cuts we've had plus the reserve bank promising to do whatever it takes to get interest rates lower still whether that's yeah. quantitative easing, the funding of the lending program, the prospect of potentially a negative OCR next year, all those things, telling people rates are going to be low, lower for longer, there is no interest rate risk out there, you know, that, and, and you're not going to get a decent return if you put your money in the bank. So um, yeah. those positives and the removal of the LVR restrictions, that's another positive. Um, the fact that banks, when they test serviceability, are asking, could you still afford your mortgage if the rates go up to X? that X is now lower, which means people, as you say, can borrow more. Can I ask, and I am I realise I can't speak about other banks, but perhaps you can share, what is the um, threshold test currently for ANZ when it comes um, to serviceability? I I'm, I'm, I may not have the latest numbers, but I know it was cut from seven and a quarter to six and a half. Wow. So that's, you know, 75 basis points, which yeah. translates directly into how much you can borrow on the day. On the other hand, 
banks are aware that the economy is in trouble because the border is closed and that's five percent of gdp gone up in smoke as long as that border is closed is it our best estimate that must result in job losses but we just haven't seen it yet because that wage subsidy it's now nearly gone now but that filled the income hole like you wouldn't believe i mean it was 14 billion dollars into the veins of the economy of a 75 billion per quarter economy yeah and, so, and i guess the economy per se doesn't really differentiate whether that money came from actual spending or just impetus yeah or well, what it doesn't differentiate is that in real income from foreign tourists or is that money borrowed from future exactly players. it doesn't matter it's cash sitting in your bank account and it all yeah. arrived in one big <laughs> smack <laughs> and so it was whoo yeah quite um a sugar rush for those whose job security was always totally fine and there would have been some of those um caught up in it it was a, a massive broom swept everybody up together you know insolvencies have practically gone to zero that um and so firms that would have fallen over if covid had not come along got wow this is huge that. this is huge because we've seen uh, um in the media at least my interpretation is that they've kind of made a big deal of some of these players that um were on the edge and some of them who have kind of right this you know these job losses these job losses but actually you're saying that the reality underneath all of that for the things that aren't necessarily being talked about widely in the media is that actually you know so insolvencies almost come to zero yes but they won't stay there of course we've swept no. everyone up with the wage subsidy and put them in a neat pile and they will all so surely this pile. is almost like every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction if those businesses were in poor shape prior to anything and then they've had an artificial um income boost and yep. they're kind of trading okay because of that then when that disappears it might even be worse yeah so our pick is that basically january february march next year is when sorry a bit of building work next door january february march next year is when the, that uh, we're going to really get that sort delayed sorting of the wheat from the chaff and of course normally that's um <laughs> there's some sort of justice to that process but not this time because there's a whole bunch of really really good firms that simply no longer have a viable business model because the border yeah. was closed that is something they could never have planned for and while you and can there shouldn't be planning for that because who does no, exactly you don't plan for the end of the world and, and you can <laughs> have it to some extent but you know there are there are many businesses that simply will have to close uh, and the other factor that means we think january february march is the crunch time is the incredible seasonality of tourism so basically mm. During winter, we tend to export more Kiwis to sunny beaches than we import skiers to New Zealand, basically. So closing yeah. the border was a net win for tourism through the winter yes. period. Over the summer, opposite is true in summer. It, and not just equal and opposite, multitudes, four to five times the multitude. And that's just in terms of the bums on seats, Kiwis, the number of people flowing through the border. Coming into the country. And then take into account that foreigners here spend a lot more than Kiwis do on average. You need 12 domestic guest nights to make up for one missing foreign tourist. And that's then, massive. you know, that, that mass is going to flip around pretty ferociously. But if you're a tourism business, the border closed at the end of a really good summer season. And then the wage subsidy arrived in a big lump. And then you had a much better winter than you were expecting, and possibly better than you've ever had before. So you're sitting on quite a pile of cash looking into the abyss. What do you yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, so what do I you mean, do? You probably hang on and hope for a trans-Tasman travel bubble because that would be a game changer. We don't know. How much... You, you talk about the um, the 12 to 1 of foreign tourism versus domestic tourism. You're also talking about, and there's an interesting thing here, I can't, like, I know the difference between a permanent, you know, migrant, but even just a tourism migrant, and it sounds like the data is a little bit patchy now, but of that um, international tourism market, how much would be attributed to coming from across the Tasman? Well, if we've got a trans-Tasman bubble with Australia, I think we can be pretty sure it'll be 100%. So, well, know, we know it'll be 100%, like, but I'm asking in the past, in the past, so like, let's say, um, and I don't know what whatever data you might have at your fingertips, but what, like on average, what percentage of international tourism and tourism dollar comes from across the Tasman well, in the a normal environment? Different. The two are very different because okay, they, gotcha. like Kiwis in Australia, we tend to go for a short time and stay with yep, them. It's a cheaper holiday than there. going to Europe. But maybe, maybe ballpark figure a quarter, but, but if okay. you, if, but the previous numbers are irrelevant. If we're the only place they can go, and they're the only then it's place going to be more, go, surely. Then we'll, we, we will win. But we will win because there's 5 million of us and 20 million of them. Exactly. Um, and so I would expect we would come out firmly in the black 
from a travel yeah. bubble. Really could well, be. Well, go the All Blacks. Here we go, firmly in the black. Let's open the bubble, perhaps. Who knows what's going to end up yeah, happening. Yeah, but, but one um, <laughs> traveller with COVID travelling around the country without going through quarantine would we're back to square one. more than undo any good that we'd done by opening yeah. the bubble. So that's, that's the challenge. It's a high risk, high reward kind of thing totally and i gotta say i'm glad neither of us are in politics because man that is <laughs> such a difficult decision to yeah. make and how do you do it right um can we go back it's sort of unrelated to it although i'm sure it is related but the the interest rate thing is something that i've kind of had and i don't know whether it's intuitively or just because it's kind of how i think and so i expect that other people think in the same way but to me i've often thought that when i've read economy pieces that by and large the um the factors that get talked about are not really i don't really understand them although i try to but the one thing that i definitely understand is if i pay x amount of dollars for a property and i need to borrow whatever the amount is and the interest rates are x and the outlook for interest rates is stable rising or falling those things i really grasp with my pocket in terms of a buying decision you know it's now a good time to buy um, what does that look like for me? Can I upgrade whatever, you know? So I've often thought to myself, man, interest rates, I reckon, just have such a high impact on purchasing decisions because I know some people are buying without a mortgage, but I'm buying with a mortgage <laughs> and many others are. And even if you take the assumption that it's just first home buyers and investors buying with finance and then that stuff flows through the chain, it still flows through the chain. So, you know, have either have economists confuse things by looking at all the other factors and not talking enough about interest rates or are they less important or am I confusing the whole thing you tell me what's it how how important are these things <laughs> how, uh, interest rates are very important house prices are actually quite um challenging to forecast but generally yeah. speaking the two best indicators are net migration and mortgage rates um, all right. so so definitely so in a nutshell let's do let's do the interest rates and let's come to that real strong one of migration so as far as the interest rates go at the moment i mean what's the cheapest you can get at the moment but 1.99 is it yeah it's under gone under two and the reserve bank seems uh, quite determined to drive them lower still yeah and we suspect they will succeed in that yeah yeah so i mean they're low headed lower this has got to be good if you are either investing in property buying property in terms of if you own it already, because prices surely must follow. Yeah, but of course, I'd just like to point out here in 2008, the Reserve Bank cut interest rates by 600 basis points, just about, and house prices dropped 10%. So it's very easy yes. to fall into the 2020 hindsight. However, let's go say, back well, to Well, of course, that, house prices went up because they cut interest rates, but they always yeah. cut interest rates going into recessions and house prices fall anyway yeah <laughs> although this, this one didn't this was different though at least from my perspective because i remember 2008 because i was selling at the time and i remember and i i, I remember distinctly because i ended up buying it was probably the worst possible time because everyone was saying the market's going to crash the market's going to crash the market's going to crash and i was in provincial new zealand palmerston north and the market was not crashing and it was the market was going to crash it's going to crash and it still was not crashing and there was still buyers and i started getting fomo as the agent and i was like man it's still going up like nobody knows what they're talking about they i'm just gonna buy it. <laughs> so anyway and then of course it did as you say it went backwards it went backwards hard and palmy in the sense that um transactions as a salesperson it's not just the price of property that counts it's the volume of transactions and the volume of transactions halved not to mention prices coming back a bit but this seems different because as i said before you know at least all the well, market now different. that's the graveyard for forecasters you've just described totally. our forecast for what's going to happen this time that basically gotcha. there's this phony war period where everyone's feeling bulletproof and yep. then the recession hits the ground if, if you like and yes. this time of course the government's had the brakes full on with the wage subsidy and then there's a second line of defense for the housing market through this mortgage deferment scheme which means basically no one should have been put in a must-sell position for the last six months totally so you haven't had the list and lift and listings from that perspective either and so you've got that normal lag before reality bites that you're talking about plus Exacerbated. extra lags deliberately introduced by policy makers to try and soften the fall and yeah. basically it is too soon to say that we're not going to have exactly the type of dynamic yeah. you just described I, I totally hear you and i and i guess the the big thing that i feel and i, I you would have clearer info on that you know national kind of stats but um whilst this was happening for me interest rates were sitting at like i can't remember exactly but 
Um, put it this way, I distinctly remember fixing my loan at 8.9% because I was like, oh my gosh, like floating is heading to 10 and I'd rather just hedge my bets and bite the bullet. And it turned out to have been a terrible decision because rates almost immediately started to fall from my recollection. But it felt like, man, interest rates might just go crazy. Whereas it seems like the opposites here where interest rates still predicted to fall. Yeah, that, that is indeed the forecast. And hardly anyone's, well, no one's even talking about inflation as a risk. One day it's going to take everyone by surprise, but that day really is hard to envisage at the moment. At some point over the next 30 years, I think we can probably say inflation will be back and that day will be yeah. very exciting, but um, very much uh, a very exciting. theoretical construct at the moment. Yeah. yeah, exciting in a bad way, I'd say. But that's certainly mm. not anyone's forecast for now, despite all the money printing going on um yeah so this is crazy like, right so the money printing and like it seems that america has kind of figured out that they um can inflate the dollar and get away with it because i can't remember the number you might know it so i think something like 70 percent of american dollars are held by offshore people to america and so they kind of go well sure we might run the risk of damaging um the, the dollar's value but actually well we're creating more damage offshore so let's just do it well, it's not just them doing it. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's yeah, exactly. It. Everyone's like, fighting fire. Never with... have any consequences. Yeah, so we'll, <laughs> I, I'm sure at some point it comes home to roost. But what? I mean, you must have given this some thought. What does that look like? Well, basically, global debt of all kinds going into the GFC was at record highs. I'm sorry, going into this COVID crisis was yes. at record highs. And now, of course, it's gone vertical. There's more and more pressure on governments to spend more by and just fund it through printing money. Um, in New Zealand, of course, our government debt was very low to start with. And it'll, on current forecast, still end lower than many countries started. But in the that US- It sounds like a good thing. It does, it is a good thing. But in the US, it's nearly 100% of GDP already. And then you add in the fact that interest rates- have Where been, does ours sit as a percent of GDP? Uh, currently, it's, well, if we took the super fund into account, we were under 10 going into this, but um, on we don't take it into, we, we're, we're a bit rough on ourselves, but if it's forecast to peak at just under 55 at the moment, and we've been there before and we've dealt with it, we've, you know, we haven't uh, done, yeah. done a Zimbabwe, we've been <laughs> been respectable, and, and certainly that would be the expectation this time, but US government debt, you know, US government debt is supposedly the world's risk-free asset, and yet it's nearly 100% of GDP. And neither the Republicans nor the I Democrats don't understand how that's a risk free problem. Sorry, no, I'm, I, I'm a bit dubious about that as well. But that is the, the foundation that global financial markets are built on is an assumption that US government debt is risk free. So, here so we go. here's a crazy I mean question. I want to throw it to you, though. Yeah, um, especially given our proximity um, to China. What if we're seeing a shift? In, I mean, we go crazy here, but I've got to ask this because I thought it surely others must. If America is really um, handling this thing poorly and continues to do, continues to do so, and who knows whether it's poorly or not, if they just continue to do the same thing, <laughs> both in terms of their health response and the economic response, and debt goes to more, can it go to more than 100% of GDP? I mean, is it more than 100%? Yes, speak. Yeah, yeah. So it does that, then surely at some point people go, actually, the one is looking pretty good or the i mean i can't imagine them doing it the euro but I, you tell me like what if there's you know could we see a shift in global reserve yeah you've just highlighted the problem what are you going to shift to i mean the Bitcoin. one is not a free float it is subject to quite extreme and unpredictable intervention measures at times the euro the european economy is in all sorts of trouble um, mm. So what do we use, the Aussie dollar? I mean, well, well, Sharon, do you, can I ask, do you own Bitcoin? <laughs> no, I don't own Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a speculative gambling tool as far as I'm concerned. You must well play the pokies. Um, well, I think it, it, it's, it's not it has looks... It looks, it looks speculative and certainly I've watched it and thought, wow, this is crazy. And it has performed um, with a, a high degree of volatility. That said, it's quite strange. I think that volatility seems to be more related to it being early, you know, early adopters are behaving speculatively. But I think its premise is more about stability and about being decentralized and about actually um, a finite supply of Bitcoin as opposed to um, printing money. You're quite right. It is a it is a quite unique in that it is obviously speculative and unbelievably volatile. And yet, for some economies, it's a safe haven. Uh, for for economies with really tight capital controls, it, it can be the only way to get your money 
out <laughs> in a sense yeah. and so it, it does it doesn't necessarily always act like a risky asset it does have some safe haven characteristics even though it's the most volatile safe haven i think i've ever seen yeah uh, look see. <laughs> I, I haven't i'm just gonna say i haven't put my money into it but i wish i had and i don't <laughs> have enough to really buy a lot of bitcoin in fact i don't think i even afford to buy one but because uh, it's bloody expensive and, and it's not i think if you're going to put money into something like that you have to be prepared to lose it or have it massively devalued because it's so yeah. volatile Definitely, that yeah. said i um, reckon if we fast forward and so here i go i could be an economist with this why not because it's not rich or economy i don't think um i predict it will get less volatile and more valuable over time as there's already some pretty big kind of um wealthy individuals who believe in it and so therefore as long as someone who's willing to trade wealth for it exists then it's i don't know what the technical term is but you can get your money out of it as long as wealthy people so want to put their money it's a into relatively it. liquid asset but it is not money don't ever mistake it for money try and buy a pizza with it it will take you three days to clear the payment <laughs> then it, it's not money and there we go guys that's the difference yeah <laughs> it's, an, it's an asset and it's relatively liquid but you still can't buy a pizza with it yet yeah. we talked um interest and i don't know if we've kind of wrapped it full circle but could you just sum up you know principally why is why are interest rates such a strong driver for housing market or predictor of housing market decline well, as you as you said yourself, um, you know, you're sitting there doing the maths going, well, I'm earning nothing in my term deposit. I'm earning a negative return after inflation and tax. So what else can I do with it? Well, property does have a, a safe haven kind of appeal, bricks and mortar. You can see it. You know that whatever happens, as long as you make your mortgage payments, you've got a real asset. It's got massive tax advantages in New Zealand. Um, which is very unfortunate, but it's highly political to try to address those. So most people are assuming not unreasonably that those tax advantages will persist. Um, so, but it, it is unusual that in times when we are forecasting the unemployment rate to rise pretty markedly, that the housing market seems to consider itself bulletproof. And we are seeing the most- But it's made up of individuals. And I'm, and I'm here going, I'm confident about my business. So I'm confident to invest in it because for those exact factors that you've talked about, if I could get more finance, I, I don't know, I'm just going to tell it. If I, if you would lend me more money, Sharon, I'd be happy to spend it on property. And whether that's a good or bad thing, actually, I, I'm not convinced it is a good thing. I think there's actually more productive things that money could go into. But unfortunately, when you're thinking with your pocket about yourself and your future, and it's something that I understand well, I'm kind of going, well, I'd probably pour it into money, uh, probably put more debt of mine into finance of property i don't know so <laughs> oh, it's skewed that way right from the, the tax system through to the bank capital what are the big which tax are the advantages to make banks safer but they have the unfortunate side effect of making mortgage lending more Too profitable than any other form of lending so that also helps funnel money in that that direction yeah. as well i mean our our pretty sluggish housing response in times you know that means that we do get more house price appreciation and it's a an investment that people feel they understand better than something yeah. or some acronym um so very quickly to look at the because you mentioned the massive tax advantages and i think this is something to be aware of um for anyone in the industry um, especially in terms of when if and when these things change to kind of go oh this could have an effect what what, what do you see being the principal tax advantages to property well if you go back to the tax working groups report they've yes. got a really great chart that will still be up to date basically just showing yep. the effective marginal tax rate on different forms of investment gotcha. um, owner occupied housing was uh, the top but then followed closely by investor housing and they were streets ahead of any other sort of investment in equities or in in a commercial property or in a real business or in a bonds or in a term deposit or anything else anywhere else you could put your money so yep. Well, yeah, obviously, housing guys. Just, just so you know, um, and thank you, Sharon. I'm going to grab this and I'll put a link to it in the comments. So thanks, Sharon. Yeah, Brilliant. it's pretty striking, and and of yeah. course, so the tax working group did recommend that we address this because it's not in New Zealand's long term interest in terms of improving our productivity, which is the the necess necessary okay. ingredient to improving our real wages. Um, that money, and I think that's where I was getting at in terms of you know good, bad. I mean, who knows? But actually. That's why I kind of go I intuitively sense that 
whilst I understand property and sure there's the tax advantages, actually we need to be investing in really productive assets because uh, you know you can't export housing unless you're going to sell it to foreigners. And so that's off the cards. And so therefore you're not exporting your land, but we need yeah. to be focused surely on exports and growing that sector. The consequences are things from very thin markets and for private capital through to a, quite a thin equity market through to you know startups and having trouble persuading anyone to lend them money and, and these things have unmeasurable but very mm. real impacts on the shape of your economy and particularly on productivity growth so yeah um, this is something that's reasonably well understood A side effect. but people love housing yeah well hey and it's i guess it's easy to see the reasons why um yep. and we'll put up that under the link to the tax working group and seeing the kind of the, um, the different asset classes and how they perform with that. Um, talk to us about population growth. I think this is really, really interesting. And you talked about it earlier on in our conversation, which was kind of, um, I can't remember your words exactly, but it sounded like there was massive net migration for a spell there. Um, what was that and where are we at today? So net migration was very strong, averaging about 2% for the last five years. I mean, that's basically more than half of our economic growth has just been more people, wow. which is not quality growth. It's not. Quite That's quite an healthy. important distinction. It suppresses wage growth. It causes yep. traffic congestion. It causes house price appreciation. It causes queues for surgery. But it is a very easy form of growth in terms of it's pretty guaranteed. You let more people in, your GDP will grow, and and you'll get um, the construction sector in particular has probably become accustomed to us needing two percent more houses every year. Um, and now it's, um, as I said, I'm very skeptical about that reported surge last year. Um, although it does make sense for it to be being revised up to some extent, because people who probably intended to come for a short time have ended up staying for a bit longer. And so it makes sense to me that it's being revised up, but still I'm I'm a bit dubious. It's it's a very, very sharp. So what period are you talking about right now, Sharon? Uh, 2019. They're showing, okay. the current numbers are showing a real surge in net migration there. Um, so that was well and truly before anything was even mentioned about COVID. Yes, but nonetheless, what's happened in 2020, basically, if you stay over nine months, then you tick over into the long-term basket. And therefore, if they thought you were short-term, you wouldn't have shown up. And now suddenly you do, nine months earlier. That's the reason for the revisions. Gotcha. I understand. So Stats New Zealand is trying to sort the wheat from the chaff, basically, which is really challenging when you've got millions of passport movements through the border every month. But of course, we don't anymore. So sorting the wheat from the chaff is a lot less difficult. There's a lot less wheat and a lot less chaff. There's hardly any movements through the border. So wow. um, it, it, the numbers now should be reliable. And what they're showing is very, very low net migration. This is huge. Mm, well, it's not huge. That's the point. It's been huge. But as it relates as it relates to the economy in yeah. general, it's huge. And as it relates to the effect of this, and you already mentioned, and it's worthwhile, um, you know, I think underlining this is that you know the two biggest drivers that you identify as you know in terms of the real estate market is interest rates, which we we kind of go, yep, they're they're low and predicted to go lower, and which sounds really good. And on the flip side of that, the other big driver, net migration, and actually whilst that's been trending consistently, I think you said about 2% and thereby contributing about 50% of the GDP growth is actually now gone. Yeah. Obliterated. So yeah. what, we're at zero. <laughs> well, it is, it is so positive. We're not losing people though, surely, right? No, so at least no it we're is not going positive, backwards. it's more positive. It's the weakest since 2012. But of course, what really matters is who's leaving and who's coming. So you could tell a bullish story where it's unemployed backpackers leaving. That's not bullish for horticulture who can't get fruit pickers, but yeah. they're not going to turn up in the unemployment statistics, for example. Or And you could tell a story that it's these gazillionaires coming back from New York and London and buying $3 million houses in Devonport. Or you could tell a story that it's 22-year-old baristas from Melbourne moving back in with their parents um, and not even renting, let alone buying. And that, uh, you know, we just actually don't know who these people are. So the good news is that uh, MB has been interviewing people coming through the system and asking them not what their incomes are, but <laughs> what their plans are, where they're going to go, why they're here. Because why don't they ask them what their incomes are? Well, maybe they do. I don't know. They haven't released okay. the data, <laughs> but I can't wait to see it because, because yes. you can tell really different stories based on anecdotes at the moment that are almost yeah. wrong. The, the anecdotes are so all So you don't have any clear data on this? No, not yet. But we know the data is coming and I, we, I really can't wait to see it because one, one thing is for sure is that our previous models of the impact 
of immigration on the economy will be very unreliable because traditionally people come here either because they've got a job offer or they've got a good prospect of getting a job. And that's true whether they're Kiwis or, or first time yes. people coming to New Zealand. Or, um, but now, of course, they may be coming for completely different reasons. And so, um, so I just, I don't think the impact of immigration on the housing market is possible to model at the moment either, but certainly the numbers. And it's important to know that it's very small right now. Yeah. And can I ask, what's your hunch in terms of um, that? in the near future? Is it still just like, I've got an idea, you know, what the current rules really are in terms of, you know, either expat Kiwis or people that want to immigrate here. But what is that likely to look like if we stay in a similar kind of environment? I feel like New Zealand at the moment, we're in a pretty special place where we don't have rampant community transmission and we are allowing people to come to the country and quarantine, but it's only a special set of people. So it mm -hmm. seems, like a no-brainer that we would expand that set of people but still maintain similar quarantine type rules yeah. so if anyone's really bullish about their opportunities here in new zealand decides to move and we allow them to do so i mean what's the prediction or have i got the frame wrong well i think we can be pretty confident about the numbers coming in because the the capacity of the quarantine system is basically fixed um because you can't gotcha can't that's huge hotels instantly what's and the current instantly. capacity Demand to come to New Zealand is infinite at the moment. So basically, once the queue of Here we go. Kiwi passports runs out, then we'll start letting in the most skilled workers and have a priority list. Apparently, wow. the medical, so guys, can I just repeat this? <laughs> overrun with American doctors and nurses wanting to come here and have. So the truth is, the truth because I hear this anecdotally from guys I'm working with saying, you know, we've got huge inquiry coming from overseas, but really at the moment they're hopeful rather than likely because um, it's Kiwi passports first. And then it's going to open but the big factor here there's almost infinite demand to come to new zealand however yeah. there's very finite supply based on that quarantine capacity very little demand to leave at the moment too i mean there were some <laughs> yeah, people course. who I'm not are leaving. trying to get home to their families obviously and and some people who um don't want to pick fruit and their work visa has run out so they have an incentive to leave so there is a steady flow out as well but yeah not many Although I know <laughs> I've recently I just you talk about anecdotals right well I you know the bullish bearish story this is interesting I am um, living in Waiheke uh, it's relatively recent but there are a lot of people there we're trying to find um, good help uh, both in terms of housekeeping and also in terms of um, child care and man it is difficult to find anyone and almost all of the people even the ones when we've clearly said um you know must have a visa they just don't and they can't get one and they're kind of going we're not leaving why don't you just help us out? You know, it's kind of this weird scenario, but they're not all yeah. leaving. Some of these people haven't been able to get a visa. We've got, um, we are forecasting a rising unemployment rate as, as these tourism businesses unfortunately fall over. And yet mm. massive shortages, not only skilled, but even unskilled labor across agriculture yeah. and horticulture, jobs that you have to be mobile for and physically quite fit. Quite difficult to find the numbers we're talking about there. Um, so it is a strange, labor market with quite a mismatch between the skills needed and the skills that are coming available and the locations and the everything else uh, basically construction wants to hire manufacturing maybe a bit as well but um, it, it's tourism and retail that are shedding staff so and that and probably in quite different parts of the country as well so yeah. it, it is really difficult it might it might seem like a political question really i'm just asking you know if you were in the reserve bank or you were kind of um providing guidance and and possibly i'm taking the assumption you you probably are consulted by lawmakers and people trying to think about this stuff given you know who you are and the, the data you have access to but what, what what are some things that could be done or that if i can go further that you just go i can't believe this is not being done <laughs> if only it were so simple uh but the issue is, <laughs> we can that, talk about it all yeah, like sharon yeah inflation targeting of course was never, never they never envisaged a situation like this basically that interest rates would end up stuck on the ground and inflation is still too low that asset price bubbles would become an issue even at a time when the economy is not doing that well i think you can legitimately step back and say is inflation targeting actually working as intended, is it actually helping us? So what do you replace it with? Exactly, there's that problem. But also the Reserve Bank sitting there going, well, we don't set our own mandate. We've, we've been given a target of hitting employment and hitting inflation. So we'll burn the top of the cake because the middle- So what's the new the mandate? What should that mandate be? 
what, you know, what well, that, that's the part. So there are some people suggesting that the Reserve Bank should take asset prices into consideration. Of course, they already do, and when they put on their financial stability hat, for example. Mm. Um, but but it's financial stability and monetary policy are actually in direct conflict at the moment. For, from a monetary policy point of view, a, a buoyant housing market will help you achieve um, higher inflation, higher GDP, higher inflation, higher employment, all those things you're trying to achieve. So it's actually look good on paper. Helpful. But from a financial stability point of view, a housing boom when um, when you're expecting unemployment rate to rise it's just it's unnecessarily volatility which is code mm. for boom bust potentially yeah. down the track that's not good for financial stability no. and so you want to put a lid on it quite quickly but that's going to make your monetary policy job harder so those trade-offs are real and they always exist to some extent but i've never seen them so stark. is it a paradox or are they actually at odds no, they're at odds right at the moment. You've got house prices going up when the economy, we're expecting it to go down, but most people aren't feeling it and are becoming increasingly sceptical that it's even going to happen. Mm, um, well, I've so, seen that before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I would say, though, I mean, you, you're predicting this to start to bite in, um, if I can use those words, at the you know, beginning of next year. Um, all I would say from my past experience, and it might seem strange, you know, I don't have any grey hair, uh, all, all I can say is I got caught up in it last time. And the main thing that kind of allowed me to get caught up in it was that it's going to crash. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. It was almost like the boy crying wolf were all the economists and analysts and people talking. And yet my proximity to the buying public was, yeah, they've been saying that for a year now. It's just not going to happen. We're the market. We're going to buy. We're going to keep buying. And so it's just going to keep going up. And so I'm definitely, you know, once bitten, twice shy, the same token, even, you know, I'm going to go with your right and we start to feel the effects, even though we start to see the effects. And I'm talking about, you know, looking at those big things that start to move the economy and shape it. And you start to see those things come into reality. I reckon the guy on the ground doesn't feel them for even further out. So if you're trucker me to start seeing this thing six months out, I don't know what the lag time is, two years. Yeah, no, you're quite right. Because most people think about the business cycle very much in terms of the labor market. And the labor market lags GDP by three to six months and GDP lags migration by three to six months and my and then you know, all these these quite hefty lags so and you get it on the way up as well you know when the economy does recover it tends to be led by um, pretty unsexy things like agricultural production and exports which but the person on the street is completely oblivious of it's, and all they care about is whether they've got a job, what their wages are, and, and and what their house price is doing, and how comfortable they feel going out for dinner and spending, splashing a little wee bit of cash and, totally. and, and having a nice time. And that lags GDP a lot. And so well, I think we're right in that phony war stage of things now, exacerbated by the unusually strong fiscal response this time, because, I mean, it's very unusual for GDP to fall 12.2% in three months. I mean, that's we so absolutely, crazy. it was the right thing to do, but it just means that that kind of, oh, we dodged a bullet. We're fine. When do we it, feel oh, the speed bump? Will, will say happened in 1998, it happened in 2008, and it's undoubtedly happening again. But the, I cannot stress enough how uncertain the economic outlook is. I really, really hope um, that we turn out to be completely wrong because the trans Tasman bubble opens up and it's a triumph and the tourism uh, because we're 100% of the market for the Australian, Australian market. market. <laughs> it all goes great and those jobs are never lost. Um, and, and we can, to some, and our commodity prices hold up because global food supply is under all sorts of pressure, which is really bad for humanity, but it's Quite contributing to our export prices doing well. You know, you can absolutely tell stories where people are quite right to think that it everything is fine with it you know we've beaten COVID we're the world's good news story but you can tell stories that yeah I, I hear the stories extreme. and I'm really grateful for your kind of positivity here with kind of going you know it's possible that because it's uncertain that quite the opposite of the doom and gloom can happen and I'm I'm I, I'm an optimist at heart, but I guess um, I'm a realist <laughs> in terms of real like estate. But also next week, if you want to talk about the range of possibilities, you know, it's, it's crazy. Wide. Right? <laughs> Can I give you? I, I want to throw you this. I, 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 I'm really conscious of the time, and I'm grateful for yours. So thank you, Sharon. If I could ask you to leave us with one thought here, um, and if it's well it's interesting to me i'm sure it'll be interesting to others so bearing in mind everything we've talked about if you were going to take a, a prediction put a line in the sand and say right well if i have to throw the dart at the board 
it is this date that we notice the upward pressure and momentum on house prices um, reversing. Go. Um, yeah, so basically we've got GDP wobbling quite significantly in, in the first three months of next year. And then um, we would expect the housing market to notice that as people just go, oh, actually, I'm not really sure I'm going to have a job a year from now. I'm not going to buy that house or maybe I'm going to downsize and, or I'm just going to hold fire. And typically you see housing volumes react three months ahead of prices. So Yes, that's there, so true. Guys, hear that carefully. Up. Sharon's nailed this, I'm sure of it. <laughs> volumes move first. So no. sorry, when did it, so we see the volumes when? Um, so we see the economy going in the first three months of the year. So we see house, housing market having a wobble at basically towards the middle of the next year. And we have prices falling, I think, two or three percent. So um, that sounds quite extreme from, from where we sit now, but that would be a really, really mild correction compared to what we saw in the GFC, for example. If, if that comes right, the market just cools down and everyone just chills for a bit, I think that would actually be a really good outcome from a financial oh, yeah. stability point of view. But, you know, we don't, it wouldn't be helpful if we suddenly solved our housing affordability problem in three months with a massive house price crash. So we do have to be a little bit careful what we wish for here. Yeah, totally. Look, I, my hunch is it's too big to fail, um, but you're right, nothing can go on forever. And I'm, I'm actually, I, I like the picture you're painting uh, and it'll be fascinating to look back on this towards the end of next year and go, how are we looking, Sharon? Thank you so much for your thoughts. I'll be wrong. Really. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see just how much you might be more, mostly there. Who knows? Who yeah. knows? We will find out. But I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts, taking this time um, with me and everyone joining us. So thank you very much, Sharon. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.